Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Hello, everybody. Michael this is Graham Waits. Brown and Michael Waits for ATP Stories. We're all about the stories of the people that make the Asian tech ecosystem. Wow, one of the most exciting in the world. And to share a story with us today, I'm joined by an author, entrepreneur, and world traveler. He's author of Chief Marketing Officers at Work. He's named by Entrepreneur Magazine as one of the 50 inspirational entrepreneurs to watch in 2017. One of 25 marketing influencers to watch in 2017 by Forbes, TEDx speaker, CEO of MWI, a global marketing digital agency, also organizer of the China Marketing Summit, all the way in Shenzhen. Joining us today on ATP Stories, Josh Steinle. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for coming, Josh. We've got so much to talk about. But I think we've got to start where you are today, Shenzhen. I know, you know everybody knows China's a happening place. Everybody's aware of Beijing and Shanghai. Some people may have heard of Shenzhen. But for those that don't know, put us in the picture because it's one of those cities that kind of, it's been in the shadow of its bigger brothers for so many years. But does it deserve to live in that shadow? Tell us a little bit about what life is like in Shenzhen. I'm so excited about Shenzhen. I think it's the future of China. I moved here one year ago. I was in Hong Kong for three and a half years before I moved to Shenzhen. And I actually moved here because I saw a documentary from Wired Magazine about Shenzhen. And I was watching this and all the watching about all the startup activity going on here. And I just thought, man, like that's where I need to go. My wife and I were looking to move to maybe Singapore. And then we watched this documentary, and my wife's just like, why are we moving to Singapore? We should be in Shenzhen. I was like, yeah, we should be. Wow. So we moved across the border from Hong Kong into Shenzhen and been here one year exactly. And it's an amazing place. There's so many tech companies, so many startups coming out. And it's kind of like for – it's kind of like the Silicon Valley of China to me. So I, I look at – compare China to – U.S. and I look at Beijing as kind of being like Washington D.C. and Shanghai is kind of like New York, and then to me Shenzhen is like the Bay Area. It's where all the entrepreneur entrepreneurial stuff is going on, where the tech development's going. I think this is where we're going to see the future development of the Chinese economy is right here. Hmm. And Shenzhen actually is like on the ocean, no? It is. It's right by the ocean. I can see the ocean right out my window right now. And Shenzhen's growing like crazy. They built more skyscrapers in Shenzhen in 2016 than all the U.S. and Australia combined. Wow. I'll well, just look at the figures. I mean, if you go back to like 20 years, 1997, the population was like half a million. I know it's 20 it, times that, right? It's yeah, just... it used to be a little fishing village, and now <laughs> it's this metropolis. I just had some family come into town today, and I was showing them the view. We were looking out a window at Shenzhen, and I'm pointing over to all these huge buildings. And they're like, oh, so is that the, is that the downtown area? Is that the central area? I'm not – no, this is – we're out on the outskirts right here. The center <laughs> is way over there, and they're like, all these big buildings are on the outside of the city? I'm like, yeah, this place is huge. The official estimates, I think, are somewhere between 10 and 15 million, but a lot of people think there are over 20 million people right. here. It's, it's kind of hard to say. I know you sort of yeah. you gave us some analogies, didn't you, with cities in the U.S. It, it, uh, tell us a little bit about that, the vibe in Shenzhen compared to other cities, and, and maybe even compare it to Hong Kong, because it's just really over the border, isn't it, from Hong Kong? Yeah, it's right over the border. Shenzhen, to me, it feels like a place where... Uh, I don't want to say this the wrong way, but there are no rules in a way. Not mm. that it's crazy or chaotic, but just people are just making stuff happen. They're just doing stuff, and they're not asking anybody's permission. They're just starting businesses, and they're doing it however they can. And so you've got huge companies with bases here. Huawei has a huge office here. Alibaba is building this huge tower and campus here. You've got DJI, the biggest drone company in the world, is a Shenzhen company, and there are all these companies that are either based here or have huge offices here. And it's kind of interesting because you've got these big companies. I mean, Tencent, WeChat, WeChat's here. You've got these big companies and these big offices, but then you also have all these little tiny startups. There's this really vibrant hardware startup scene here. So there are all these people coming here from other countries, from France, from the UK, from the US, and they're coming here to do their hardware start startups because... Instead of 
shipping stuff back and forth between their home base and China and it taking two months to go through the prototyping process, they can get it done in three or four days here because all the factories are just right here. There's just a lot of activity, a lot of excitement here. It's just a great, it's a great vibe. It's a great feeling. Josh, what is it about Shenzhen, right? I mean, I've been, so I've been in the region for almost 30 years, right? And I, like my first time in China was 1991. And I've, n- I've never been to Shenzhen, but what is it about? Is it just the geographical location, the proximity to Hong Kong? Like, what is it that, that's taken it from 500,000 people to 20 to 25 million people? I mean, I know manufacturing's there. I get that. But why was it there? Was it the highway that went there? What, what's, what's your view? Uh, you know, I don't know the answer for sure. But from my perspective, the way it looks to me is that it is a combination of things. One You've got a free market zone, and so there are lower taxes. There are some regulatory issues that make it business-friendly here. I mean, I came here as an American. It's very easy to start a business, get incorporated, start hiring people, and just do business. And so there wasn't that much red tape. It was just really easy. Everybody's been friendly. Everybody's been helpful. So you've got that side of things. You do have the manufacturing base, so you have all these factories and a lot of manufacturing know-how and supply chain know-how. And so if you're starting a business that has anything to do with a physical product and shipping and logistics, there are all these people here who know how all of that works. And so it's just the natural place. If you're going to make a physical product, this is where you come. Maybe not necessarily Shenzhen, but the Pearl River Delta area with Shenzhen and Guangzhou and Dongguan, all these cities are kind of getting connected. They're all kind of one huge mega city. And this this is where you come to do the manufacturing stuff. I I mean, maybe there's some other reasons to go other places in China, but this is just, there's so much of it here. And it's so easy to find the expertise. It's so easy to get co- factories competing against each other. And so you can drive the price down for getting your product made. And then yeah. I think there is the location too in in terms of shipping that you've got major ports here. You've got the Hong Kong port, you've got the Shenzhen port. And so shipping-wise, there's a lot of that. And then it's also really close to the rest of Southeast Asia, which is this huge, rapidly growing economy. And so if you're going to get prop down to Southeast Asia, it's, it's a natural place to be in, involved in as well for that. It's a nice contrast, isn't it, from where you're from originally? Because I want to talk about that a little bit. I want to talk about your business and what you do in Asia. But I think it's kind of useful for the listeners to find out a little bit where you came from. Obviously, you weren't born in Asia. The world in which you came from was was very different. And if I can use your own words, talk about where you came from. You were a young teen, a dinosaur junior fan, and a skater. I can't, if you go way back to that sort of genesis of your hmm. life and where you started out and where you are now, did you ever think you were going to end up somewhere like Shenzhen? Could you ever imagine that? Was that ever a thing in your sort of early life where you're thinking, I've got to get out and explore the world? Or that, did that just sort of happen? It never occurred to me as a kid or even in, I mean, before I was 30, I never imagined this. I never imagined I'd be living in Asia. And so to be here, it is kind of surreal. It's kind of like living a dream. The funny thing, though, is I grew up in Los Angeles and the place I grew up in Los Angeles became very Asian while I was growing up there. When I was a little kid, it was very much uh, Caucasian white people where I grew up. And then a lot of people started moving in from Taiwan, and then people from mainland China started moving in. So by the time I was a teenager, 17, 18 years old, my city that I grew up in was about 60, 70% Asian. Wow. So the funny thing is that now, coming to China, it actually is kind of like going back home. When I go home, all the stores have Chinese signs on them. (laughs) Everybody's Chinese. Everybody speaks Chinese. So I go home, and it's like... I haven't really left China. I'm just in the same place, but it's in the U.S. It's kind of like a little China there. So it's kind of funny to be here in a way and be, feel like, wow, now I know where all these people are coming from that have been buying up all the houses where I live, my hometown. Wow. Yeah, but you're comfortable with that as well. That's the key, isn't it? Because some people don't like that kind of change. I mean, just going back to that conversation you said with your wife when, they look, when you were looking around and you looked at Singapore and then you saw Shenzhen – why did you? What was it about that you thought? Yes, without having been there or without having lived there, you thought that was the place that you needed to go, rather than Singapore, which is a lot more comfortable and familiar for, if I can use the word, Westerners. 
<laughs> yeah, you know, I love Singapore. I think it's a great place. I love visiting there. Uh, but when I go to Singapore, it does feel a little bit too nice almost, like too proper, too maybe a little bit sterile. Uh, and again, I don't want to be negative about it or anything. I mean, we almost moved there. We really like it there. But Shenzhen, the entrepreneurial side of it, the startup side of it, just the growth uh, and kind of the grittiness of the, that, and it's just that's exciting to me. It's exciting for me to be around startups, even though I started my business in 1999, so we're not a startup by any stretch, but I still like to run my business like a startup. I still like to think of myself as in the trenches entrepreneur, and I like to be around other entrepreneurs, and I like to be around a lot of high growth, exciting, new, cutting edge companies. Right. And that's part of what I love about being here in Shenzhen. Yeah, yeah. We, we had this conversation, didn't we, Michael, about Singapore before. I mean, you chose when you left Tokyo to move to Bangkok over Singapore. Was it a similar kind of thing for you? Yeah, I mean, for me, it was. it's a slightly different metric. But, but in the end, I think the decision is really the same. I wanted to go someplace that had growth, that was dynamic, and that hadn't sort of experienced the, I will say, almost like quasi westernization that Singapore has gone through over the past 50 years. And, and I agree with Josh, right? Like I wouldn't minimize what's happened to that Island in the last like half a century, considering what it was when it started and what it is today. It's nothing short of a miracle, both economically and socially. Mm -hmm. um, but from a day to day place where I'd like to live, I, I like the grittiness, right? So I like what I call the chaos. I mean, the order inside the chaos. And I have to believe that in Shenzhen, there's a feeling of insane energy and if you're dealing with startups, and this is the thing that's really interesting to me, Josh, maybe you can talk about this a little bit too, but this whole concept of being in a place where there's so much energy and yeah. so much opportunity and possibility, and then to have the startup community there, it, you just must wake up every day and feel like excessive enthusiasm. Yeah, I just, it keeps me alive. I feel this energy. when I, I really notice it when I go back to the U.S. I go back to visit Utah or even California. And I kind of feel like everybody's moving in slow motion. And I feel like <laughs> I want to yell at everybody and say, like, hurry up. Like, come on, let's do stuff. Like, let's make Something. things happen. Anything. And yeah, and I just feel like I feel like it's kind of a ghost town. I go, I mean, seriously, I go back to Utah and I walk around. I'm like, where are all the people? Like, where <laughs> is everybody? Like, was there an apocalypse and I missed the memo or something? Like, is everybody hiding up in the mountains? And I start feeling into this almost like reverse claustrophobia where wow. I feel like I need to get back around a lot of people. And then I come back to Hong Kong or Shenzhen and I'm in the crowd on the street and I'm getting bumped into. I'm like, oh, yeah, this is better. I like this. <laughs> now, now I'm alive again. You're home. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. amazing. I want to change gears a little bit here, Josh. I want to throw in a story which you shared with us on your, your blog, which is about how you got your start. And I don't think this is a start for you as an entrepreneur, but it's kind of interesting leading into what we're talking about where you are now. And I know Michael will like this as a financial guy who worked in investment banking for so many years. But Josh, you tell a story about your first brush with earning money when you were four or five years old, right? And you said, you, I can't believe this, your dad. I don't know what his motivation was, but he gave you a three-column financial ledger and sat you down <laughs> with that and uh -huh. told you to use it. And that was sort of your first start. I mean, for a four- or five-year-old kid, what was your reaction? And how do you think that sort of set you on a course? Well, you know, when you're a kid, you don't – everything that your parents do is just normal, right? Yeah. So, I mean, my dad gets me down when I'm four years old or five years old, and he gives me this three-column financial ledger and says, hey – Here's one column, that's your money coming in. Here's your other column, that's your money going out. And here's your balance, that's what's left over. And I thought, okay. And he said, every penny you get, you track in here. And I thought, okay. <laughs> and that just seemed normal. So that's just what I grew up with, is that you track every single penny and you know where every single penny goes. And uh, yeah, so I mean, that was a good lesson in just financial management, at least tracking it. Now, the funny thing is I'm not conservative by any stretch. I'm a very risk. Uh, I love risk. I love going beyond the boundaries and I love stretching things and I love, I mean, but I track all the money. I make sure that it all gets tracked. I keep track of things to the penny. Um, but then I'm still very risky with it. So it's probably a good thing that my dad trained me. So at least I get, keep track of what I'm doing with the risks that I'm taking. 
Yeah. And he probably it's probably a smart move on your dad's behalf because he probably saved about what 50 60,000 bucks on an MBA just from that one lesson, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sitting you down with Maybe. that. So well done dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you feel I mean where you are now? I mean you're in Asia and I want to talk a little bit about that whole idea of you know that sort of street smart entrepreneurialism that you kind of grew up with. I know there's there's a few other stories which maybe we can sort of explore a little bit about being a a skater and trying to get skate stuff so you end up going into business yourself and you and your friends and so on. But you became an entrepreneur probably without thinking, yeah, I'm going to become an entrepreneur. But it was kind of that street smart entrepreneur who sort of learned because they had a need or wanted to fix a problem or, you know, sort of learn money through sort of the very basic principles like your dad taught you. And where you are now in, in Asia, where well, that's sort of all around you, isn't it? Do you see some sort of parallels there? And then, you know, you, you, on the other hand, you've got this this world where people, yeah, maybe they do the MBA thing and they go into the big organizations and they sort of, you know, that's how they learn entrepreneurialism. But it's very, very different to what you're experiencing now. Yeah, learning entrepreneurship on the streets is, I think, ultimately the only way that you learn entrepreneurship. If you learn it in a classroom or you're in a corporation and the corporation says, hey, let's go start a side business or something like that, like, you can call that entrepreneurship. I mean, that's fine. But it's just, it's different than going out and starting your own business from scratch. It's different from the hustle that you experience on the streets, so to speak, doing something, using your own money out of your own bank account, financing things on credit cards. That's a whole different ballgame, and it's it creates a different mentality. You can tell when you talk to somebody who's been through that kind of entrepreneurship and you start trading stories, then there's this instant connection where you say, okay, yeah, like we understand each other because we've been through those experiences. We know what it means to not be able to make payroll. We know what it means when you say how relieved you are when you use your credit card and it actually works and it doesn't get declined. Like some (laughs) of us have been through that stuff and others haven't. And when you've been through it, you talk to somebody and you're like, oh, yeah, we've been there. Like we get that. And you learn a lot of lessons from that's the street. I have a master's degree. I love school. I love going to school. I love education. But I've learned so much more from just experiences in the trenches, in the weeds, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Look, look even Elon Musk came out recently, right? And he's, he's, if nobody else, he's the poster boy for, you know, being a startup guru or just like taking risk and all those other things. And it just seems like it comes so naturally to him. But, you know, frankly, if you sit in a room with a bunch of entrepreneurs, what you'll find is a lot of superhuman emotions around fear, and um, fear of failure, but also depression and things that are really hard to handle. Like you said, it's really kind of strange when you walk into a store and you're afraid to take your credit card out because you don't know if it's going to clear. And then once you finally establish yourself and start making a regular income, remember what you've created out of zero, right? From nothing. This is the key. And it actually works. It's a pretty high feeling, I think, no? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And then and then sometimes you feel guilty about it <laughs> See, I have a thing where I get money in and I'm like, well, I got to reinvest this. I got to put this back into the business. I keep yep. got to keep building it. It's hard for me to take money out of my businesses. And so my partner and I actually have an agreement that we get the, paid the same amount. And the reason we do this is that my partner is a little bit better at paying himself than I am. Right. And so we have this agreement that our salaries are matched. And that's to guarantee that I will actually pay myself. It's really a favor to my wife. <laughs> to say, hey, I'm going to match my salary to my partners, and my wife's like, oh, thank goodness, because <laughs> before I brought on this partner, it was just like, oh, yeah, we can't pay ourselves this month because I'm investing it in this other thing over here, and my wife's like, oh, good heavens, and yeah. you don't mind if I eat Finally. this month, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> but that's great. I mean, I love that type of entrepreneurship. That's sort of where I consider myself from, you know, from that sort of grassroots style entrepreneurship, building something from zero, often with your own money and bootstrapping it rather than Mm -hmm. sort of going through the accelerator program and you know i didn't go to stanford i didn't do the computer engineering degree all those kind of things but i think you know where i look at myself and one of the reasons i love especially going to some of these high growth cities in asia and i'd exclude tokyo from that because it's got real comfortable but you go anywhere else in asia there's not i wouldn't say it's a sense of entitlement but i think people aren't comfortable and that sense of they're not comfortable yet means that they still have that kind of cutting edge entrepreneurialism, isn't it? That they don't feel 
that, you know, everything's done and they can put their feet up. They have to keep working. They have to keep pushing because, you know, like you said, like with yourself, Josh, it's like you, you still have that sort of mindset that you're, you, you know, have to push yourself to pay yourself, right? Mm -hmm. And I think you see that a lot in Asia, don't you? I mean, I'm wondering, you know, people coming from outside of Asia, whether they kind of get that or whether that's something unique to Asia. I'm just curious about both of your experiences on that. Yeah, I'm not sure, but I, I know for myself, I'm uncomfortable getting comfortable or I'm uncomfortable with the idea of being comfortable. That's probably my number one fear is to get comfortable because if I get comfortable, then I stop. I stop progressing. I stop, stop moving forward. I stop doing stuff. For me, the nightmare would be like being stranded on a desert island or something and just not being able to do anything, not having access to do anything. I mean, I, I guess I would start building something on the desert island and start right. trying to create stuff on the island. But the idea of being held back, but really, it's, it's worse when I think of myself being comfortable with it, like accepting that hey, I've made it, I've made my money, and now I'm just going to enjoy it. Like, to me, that makes me shiver. It just makes me feel like, oh, I hope I never get to that point. Because for me, life is about excitement and waking up and saying, oh, I can't wait for the day to begin. I can't wait for Monday so that I can get back to work and start doing things and building something and creating things. To me, that is, that's what's exciting about life. That's what gets me excited about entrepreneurship. And I think in China, we're still in the stage where people are not comfortable because there are a lot of people in China who remember what it was like to go hungry, to not have enough food to eat. And so they are not comfortable, even if they're making money. I mean, some of these people have gotten very wealthy over the past few years but they're still not comfortable because they look at it as, hey, this could be taken away at any moment. I mean, who yeah. knows? I could get <laughs> robbed by my partner. The government might come in and take it all away. I mean, who knows what's going to happen? And so I don't think these people are comfortable yet. Maybe the next generation will get oh, comfortable yeah. and get lazy or something, but it seems like the current generation uh, is definitely not comfortable, and I hope they pass that on to their kids to n not get comfortable as well. Yeah, it's one of the hardest things to do, right? I mean, it sounds to me like the Depression-era mentality we had in the United States, right? You come out of the end of World War II and people start getting rich, and yet they were so poor or so they struggled for so long that there was not all this excessive consumption after the war, right? Even though people were getting wealthy. And then you moved into the 70s and 80s, more of the 80s, right? And it was just like the next generation just said, oh, my. And now we talk about conspicuous consumption. I think, though, in China and in the rest of Southeast Asia, there's so much generational work to do to take people out of, I don't want to say poverty, but just to, the, the, the opportunities are so huge that if you just wake up every day, like you said, and just get something done, the excitement is, is already there. And I don't think it's going to go away in the next generation either. So I, I tend to agree with you. But Michael, you've spent time here in Tokyo as well. And I wonder yeah, if that as a case study, you know, if you look at Tokyo and Japan generally, it had the depression era mentality, got very rich, 80s bubble, and then this whole sort of generation that came in afterwards. I mean, young people in Japan today, with all due respect, just aren't willing to take the kind of risks that Josh has taken in his life, right? You know, and that's kind of wonder. Yeah. If we talk about startups, where are the startups in Japan, right? We've got the big corporate startup schemes and all that. There's none of that grassroots stuff, right? There isn't, and, and I think the reason, and, and maybe Josh can talk about this in China, but in Japan, there's this whole concept of personal failure, right? Yeah, I was gonna say. So if you've ra if you've raised money, in, if you've raised money in Japan and you fail, like you could go until you die, like paying that money back, even if you don't theoretically owe it to anybody contractually. Mm -hmm. So you have to sort of culturally change that idea of failure, and the acceptability of failure in China. You know, again, because people are coming out of what was essentially a massively state controlled. Um, existence, you just this concept of the freedom to do something is so exciting, right? I mean, I always, I've said actually for the past five or six years that there's been no better generation to be, and I live in Thailand, so I'll say Thai, again, because free flow of information for the most part, freedom to do whatever you want, the, you know, police states are essentially over, you know, within the region, except of course for North Korea, Myanmar, the last one kind of to fall, and every single young person in these cities is just thinking, okay, I could go work for Coca-Cola or Toyota and that's going to make my mom and dad really happy, but never mind. 
I may never have this opportunity again. You're right. Once you see like a generation of people get stuff taken away, kind of at will, you're willing to go out and take a risk because you figure, I may never have this opportunity again. Mm. And that's really that's a really powerful incentive to try to create something, I think. Josh, I want to turn this over a little bit to the marketing side of things as well because maybe in a way we're also dealing with different worlds here. Something that you wrote a while back, you wrote an article which caught my attention, which is about influence for executives. And I think about this in terms of CMOs and so on. And you talked about putting your email address everywhere and you encouraged yeah. CMOs. I mean, these are C-level executives, right? To go and put their email addresses out there. And I think that sort of would have got a bit of pushback. People would have thought, well, you know, I'm just going to get spam. That's not what I do. You know, I didn't become a CMO to put my email address out there, blah, 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 that kind of stuff. There's that similar kind of generational difference, isn't it? That we've just talked about here with entrepreneurialism and risk and so on. How, how was the kind of response to that when you put that article out there? And what kind of people really got it? Yeah, so, I mean, the whole idea there is you have more power if you're more accessible. And you can influence more people if you're more accessible. And if you hide your email address, then you make yourself less accessible. If you put your email address out there, then it's more accessible. But, of course, then everybody's like, oh, but if I put it out there, I'm going to get spammed. It's going to get scraped. It's going to go in all these databases, and I'm going to have this nightmare. And my response is, you know what? I've put my email address out there for 15 years everywhere, and I don't have a spam problem. Gmail takes care of my spam problem, so it's not yeah. a big deal. But I'm very accessible. It's very easy for people to reach out and find me and contact me. And because of that, I'm exposed to opportunities. And I think most people get why I do it. I think a lot of people are still afraid to do it themselves because they just say, oh, man, but I just they just think that they're going to get just this mountain of spam and it's going to be a nonstop nightmare. But, hey, I've been doing this for 15 years, and no, it's not a problem. But Josh, you make a great point, actually, and I've never been able to put it into words, but I love what you just said. Like, your accessibility is your access to power. It gives you power. Because there are so many people that have sort of theoretical power, but because they don't interact with enough people, they don't get to exercise it in a way that has impact. Really mm -hmm. interesting concept, actually. Yeah, yeah. I, I like it. Let's just talk about that, because you've put your email address out there, Josh, and published i mean i how many blog posts have you published i mean i'm just looking at the number i'm just going through the list here but in terms of interviews and i was just going through your press page and i advise anybody who wants to sort of look at what the outset of doing what josh is you know telling people to do what the results are out there look at josh's own press page i mean there's just hundreds of interviews and you've how many blog posts have you written over a thousand yeah, I let's see. Before I started writing for Forbes and all these publications, I had written somewhere around a thousand posts on my own blog, just my personal blog. And then I got signed up to write for Forbes about four, four or five years ago. And then that expanded into writing for Mashable and TechCrunch and a bunch of other publications. And I've written about 300 articles for like top tier publications. Mm. And so, yeah, I've written quite a bit. And I put my email address in a lot of those articles too. <laughs> Right. But you don't get any spam. I'm just curious as well, because where you are, I mean, in Asia, I don't know, maybe sort of I need to be brought up to speed. But my sort of impression of a lot of Asian companies is that they're still very hierarchical. So, you know, if you were to go and tell people, especially a CMO, put your email address out there. I mean, of all the places in the world, I'm just assuming I'm coming in blind here. I would have thought this would be the hardest place to get a response on that. It might be. It might be the most difficult place to get people to do that. It's hard to get uh, – I mean, there's – this isn't just an Asian culture thing, but anywhere in the world, it's hard to get people to put themselves out there in public. I mean, public speaking is the number one phobia in the world, right? Mm. So – and it's hard for people to make themselves the face of a company – we do see some people who are comfortable with it. I mean, Elon Musk is comfortable with it. Steve Jobs was comfortable with it. But those people are really the exception. Most companies are run by CEOs that, I mean, you would have a hard time naming the CEOs of a lot of these large corporations that are very well known. But if I said, hey, name the CEO, you'd be like, hmm, I, I, yeah, I don't really know. And 
a lot of executives, especially though in Asian culture, are uncomfortable putting themselves out there because there's a stigma against that, right? You don't want to show off. You don't want to brag. You don't want to take credit for everything. You just kind of want to run the business and make the money and get the rewards, but you don't necessarily want to be the face of the company. But that's the way business is going worldwide is that people do business with people they like and trust and they do business with brands and companies where there's a face to associate with that company. And so it's becoming necessary for executives to become their own influencers or as they say here in China, they say KOLs or key opinion leaders. So really the executives of these companies need to go out and do KOL campaigns or influencer marketing, but use themselves as the influencers rather than hiring people off Instagram. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's the default, isn't it? That's the easy way of doing it. I mean, we, we see people like Jack Ma as an example. I mean, he, he sort of does this very naturally, right? But for every Jack right. Ma... He's, must... got no pro he's got no problem doing it. He's out there. And that's the way all executives should be. I mean, not crazy like Jack Ma necessarily, but they should be out there. They should be the face of their company. Right. But wasn't he, before he was doing that, wasn't he an English teacher before? I'm just curious. I mean, he didn't sort of come from that traditional business background. I don't know his full story, but wasn't he teaching English somewhere and there and there and then, and then you know, communicating or doing a, a non-traditional business startup environment and so on? I don't know. Maybe you know more about it than I. But it just goes to show what kind of man he is in terms of his background, right? Yeah, Jack Ma seems to be my type of guy. I mean, he's got the definitely the non-traditional Asian entrepreneurial route. It's more of a Silicon Valley type story where it was a bunch of guys that he got together in an apartment and said, hey, let's start this business. We're going to sell stuff online. And this big group of guys and gals got together and they started this business. But it was very much one of those, hey, let's just do this. We can do this. There's no reason we can't do it type of stories as opposed to, a corporation going and starting a company or something. It was it was what we think of in the West as the traditional entrepreneurial story, but that's very rare still here in Asia. And especially back when Alibaba was getting started, it was practically unheard of, I think. Mm, exactly. But I'm just curious as well, something you mentioned about that, the you know, key opinion leaders type approach where a lot of people will think it's just it's the done thing based on sort of the old school model of just go out and get people on instagram and get them to retweet your stuff or whatever that's sort of commonly practiced isn't it i mean that's sort of how things are done when it comes to influence but what you're teaching is something that's a little bit different well very different in the sense that you're teaching people to be accessible and vulnerable which i think is not in the toolbox of a lot of senior executives is it no, they really struggle with it, especially the vulner vulnerable part, because in their minds, you put on a show of knowing everything, being able to do anything, being powerful, having no weakness. That's what you want to show the world, and they think that that inspires confidence in with consumers, and that's the way it used to be, but that's not the world that we live in anymore. What consumers know is that nobody's perfect, everybody's got problems, and if you're telling me that you've got no problems and you know everything that's going on, I know you're lying. And so if you present that facade of invulnerability to people, then you actually lose trust because people know that you're not perfect. But when you open up and you say, hey, I made this mistake or here's some challenges I've experienced or here's when I did this thing wrong and here's what I learned from it or here's what I'm doing wrong right now and I'm trying to fix it right now and you really make yourself vulnerable, then people actually trust you and they'll forgive you when you do make mistakes because they'll say, hey, I like this guy. He's vulnerable. I feel like I can trust him. I'm willing to work with him and stick with him because he's opened up to me. And that's tough for a lot of executives to make that transition. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say the more you humanize yourself, the more people can identify with you. And I think it goes a long way to being able to influence people if they feel like you're similar to them, no? Yeah, exactly. I mean, think about it. Even with a company like Huawei, where I'm buying a phone from them, if I buy a phone from Huawei and I don't know who the CEO is, I mean, I really do not know who the CEO is, even though I'm here in China and Huawei is this big company and I can see one of their buildings out my window, but I don't know who the CEO of Huawei is. And so when something goes wrong with my phone, my Huawei phone, 
I'm willing to go online and I might rip that product apart and criticize Huawei up and down and say all sorts of negative stuff online. And that can really hurt Huawei in, in a financial way. But if I knew who the CEO was and I felt like, oh, this guy's really cool and I've got this great kind of relationship with him. Like think about Richard Branson with the Virgin Companies. Richard Branson is this guy who's out there and he seems really likable and he seems really friendly and he seems like a guy that you would like to hang out with. If I experience a problem with a product that comes from one of Richard Branson's companies, I'm less likely to be negative online or leave a negative review because I like Richard Branson and these are his companies. Whereas with Huawei, if it's a faceless company, I don't feel anything wrong about being critical because I'm not being critical of a person. I'm just being critical of this faceless entity that has no personality. So this is one way that when an executive is an influencer, it really does impact the bottom line because it leads to better goodwill, it leads to a better brand, it leads to better PR, all these things that really do impact business in a very financial way. Mm. Setting the bar quite high, though, if people have to sort of look at Richard Branson and say, we've got to be more (laughs) like him, right? I mean, but there must be small (laughs) steps that people can take. I mean, any... um, Somebody's got to tweet us and let us know who the CEO of Huawei is because, you know... Get this guy on the show, see if we can find out a little bit more about him, at least get his name out there. But, you know, people like that, what are the small steps that they can take? Because I'm sure they're surrounded by people and they're thinking, wow, you know, I can't be vulnerable because I've got shareholders, right? Or I have vested interests and I want to say something's wrong because, you know, that may backfire on me. Where do you start? Well, I mean, it can be as easy as, I mean, here in China, it wouldn't be Twitter, it'd be WeChat or Weibo, right? Uh, or MeowPie, which is one of the new live video apps that's really hot right now. But there are all these apps that make it really easy for the executives to go out and publish what they're doing. And if they just document what they're doing a little bit, saying, hey, I'm going to this meeting today, and we're talking about such and such in this meeting. If they can just document a little bit of what they're doing, then that goes a long way towards humanizing them because it shows like, hey, I'm a CEO and I have a normal day and I'm getting up here and I'm going to work and I'm struggling with this challenge. And if they can just do a little bit of documentation, that goes a long way. There's also just blogging that they can do online. They can go on LinkedIn and anybody can write a post. And if the CEO said, hey, I'm going to spend five minutes, I mean, they can spend five minutes, five minutes a day, and I'm going to write a really short LinkedIn post and just, it's going to just be about my day or something that I'm thinking about or something I'm dealing with and they can post a little thing people will follow that and they'll take interest in it and then when something happens that's newsworthy about that company then the press goes and they look through all those posts that have been made on LinkedIn and they can find positive things there if the CEO is not putting himself or herself out there and being public about what they're doing then when something happens in the news then the press latches on to what's negative because they can't find any of this history of the positive stuff that the executives ha- should have been putting out. Mm, right. There's no other side of the story to, to balance it out. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah I mean, it, it, it's as easy as just jumping on any of these apps. So, I mean, there's, again, China's different, right? But if we were in the West, we'd say, you know, Snapchat, Instagram Stories, Facebook Live, just posting on Facebook, LinkedIn. I mean, there are all these places that an executive can go online, post about his or her day, document a little bit about what they're going through, share stories, share business stories, challenges. And the more you do it, the more you see opportunities to do it. So it might be hard at first, but once you start doing it, you start just seeing these ideas everywhere and then you can't stop. You say, oh man, I want to write about this right now and I want to talk about this. And then you start getting questions from people, people responding and saying, hey, I read your post on such and such. What about this? And then the executive can just respond to that question. There is a new post. So how far do you go to that? Do do you, does this guy need to be posting pictures of what he ate for lunch or strictly business? I mean, what's the sort of fine line here? Well, you know, the whole uh, posting photos of your food and everything. I mean, there's some. There's a uh, governor of Wisconsin in the United States. He's posting what he eats every day, and it's kind of funny. But uh, <laughs> I, wouldn't post, I wouldn't necessarily post pictures of my food. But posting about, I mean, really, it goes back to that vulnerability. If you want to be authentic, you have to take a risk. You have to open yourself up to something that's kind yeah. of scary to you. That's what builds trust. 
And if executives can talk about challenges they've faced, worries they have, concerns, even if it's from the past. I mean, if they can say, hey, five years ago I was dealing with this challenge and I was really worried about such and such, but then here's what happened and here's how we fixed it. There's still some vulnerability in there. Ultimately, what you want to work up to is the point where you're willing to share what you're going through right now in real time and say, I'm struggling with this problem right now. That's a harder thing. But hey, if you can't do that, start with your challenges that you were facing five years ago and you've already solved and overcome and share those stories. That's great advice. Michael, you work a lot with startups, especially at the early stages where they're just sort of putting those teams together. Whether you're investing or advising them or helping them raise funding, do you look for that? You know, if you look for a leader within that startup team, somebody who can go out and tell that story to the public? Because I imagine, you know, with these sort of limited budgets that a startup has, a key part of that is that leader who can go out and connect with people and influence people through telling the startup story. And they're not going to get everything right, are they? So they've got to be honest and vulnerable and so on. I mean, how much do you look for when you're doing this? Yeah, I mean, so for me, it's really important to work with a founder, regardless of what their experience has been up till now, who's comfortable talking to other people, particularly investors. Um, and it all what it means is that they have to express honesty and actually be honest, right? And that, that type of stuff is really important. But I also think they have to humanize themselves, too, like particularly with what's going on in the startup ecosystem in Southeast Asia. One of the things I do is I, you know, I coach people just to be real. And it doesn't mean, you know, some people think being real means just being freewheeling and crazy. But the reality is you just just be yourself, behave the way you would normally behave and let people judge you to the extent that you're proud of your own personality. But also, you know, show enough enthusiasm so people know you, you love what you do, but don't over enthusiasize yourself because it'll turn some people off. Right. They can't deal with that level of energy. But I think this whole concept of you can actually coach somebody how to be able to better influence other people, right? And one of the key things to me is learning the things that the other person is interested in, right? So I try to teach people all the time, like, don't necessarily just continue to talk about yourself, but have a two-way dialogue with someone. And the other thing that's really important to me is never turn down a first meeting, right? Never, because you just don't know who you're going to meet. And I think this gets back to what Josh was saying about accessibility, Right. As some founders become more and more and more successful and famous, they just turn everything down. But they don't know like who their next partner is going to be, um, who their next um, competitor is going to be. And for me, I, I never like I said, I never turned down that first meeting because it's a great way to be able to be accessible and to be able to spread your influence. And I'd, I'd love to know what, what Josh thinks about that. Yeah, I've been experiencing this lately on both sides. On the one hand, I've been getting busier and busier, and it's harder and harder for me to take those first meetings sometimes. Absolutely. I still try to. I still I, I have an article out there about how I will go get a cup, cup of coffee with anybody, and I still try to stand by that. But sometimes it's just hard to schedule it. I mean, you can't meet with everybody, and it's even even though I'm here in Shenzhen, still – like a lot of people are reaching out and saying, hey, I want to meet with you. And it's like, well, if you come here to Shenzhen, I'll meet with you. <laughs> and then people do. And it's like, wow, they actually came out here. Right. <laughs> and uh, um, so it's it's hard to uh, meet with everybody. And at some point, you kind of you have to say no eventually just because you run out of time in the day. And yet, on the other hand, I'm trying to meet with other people that I want to get access to and that I want to talk to and that I hope that maybe we can do something together that will be mutually beneficial. Right. And a lot of the people that are very big names, I'm surprised how accessible they are and how willing they are to meet with me, to talk with me, to give me time, which I'm very grateful for and very appreciative of. But I'm just surprised that they're even willing to do it. They're willing to say yes and give me the time of day because I know how busy they are and how many demands that they have. And then sometimes I turn down by other people and they just say, no, sorry, I don't have time to do that. And I could be offended by that, but I, I just brush it off and say, you know what? They probably are super busy. They've probably got a ton of stuff going on. And I respect that. And maybe I'll come back to them in six months and see if they're not as busy. So how do you get access to those traditionally inaccessible people what is it with your approach when you approach these influencers or people who are super successful is it in what you say is it because of who you are or is there anything that you can share with us and the listeners that they could take away in terms of tweaking their approach to get 
hold of these inaccessible people? Yeah, there's a great book out there called Influence by Robert Cialdini, and he's yeah. also got a new book out called Persuasion, which is the sequel 20 years in the making to Influence. And he goes through a lot of the science of influence and how to impact people. And some of the tips that I've gotten from that book are that a lot of these things I'd already been kind of doing in my own life, but then I read the book and I said, oh, this is why I was drawn to do this is because right. of this this psychological factor or something. But there are things like they've done studies showing that if you can identify something that's similar or a shared experience or some something that's the same about you and the person that you're reaching out to, that person is more likely to trust you. And it can be as simple as something like, oh, hey, I noticed that we were born the same year. Mm. What does that have to do with anything, right? <laughs> I mean, I guess you could say, hey, we're the same age. Maybe we have some shared experiences that way or something. But really, whether you were born the same year or not, that doesn't mean you're going to be a good business partner. That doesn't mean you're a good person to meet with. I mean, there are so many other factors that go into whether you should trust somebody other than if they just happen to be born the same year as you were. But studies show that if you mention something like that and say, hey, we were born the same year, that person automatically trusts you more than somebody who doesn't bring anything up like that. So when I'm reaching out to people, I always look for something that I have in common with that person, and I try to find something that we really have in common. And so, for example, I'm putting on another event right now under my side hustle, which is called Influencer Inc. It's an organization to help people become influencers and thought leaders. And I'm organizing an event, and I have to reach out to 50 people and get them to participate as presenters in this event. And, of course, I want to reach out to people who are famous and influential, and these are the busy people. So I reached out to one guy, and I said, hey, I bought your book. I'm reading your book. I'm loving it. I'd love you to speak at this event. And so my connection there was, I'm reading your book. What I didn't say was that I just bought your book about a half hour ago, <laughs> and the reason I bought your book is because I wanted to reach out to you, and I wanted to have something I could say, and so I bought your book, and I really am reading it, and I really am interested in it, but it wasn't that I happened upon your book, and I loved it so much, and that's why I'm calling you. It was more, I already know who you are. I know I want to get you in here, and I'm going to read the book. But also I'm going to buy the book so that I can drop that I am reading your book and that you know that I'm kind of serious about this. Mm. Well, as I got into the book, after I made the initial invitation, which thankfully he accepted, but if I actually had read the book before I invited him, I mean the whole book, then what I would have found out was that he has a history of multiple sclerosis in his family. Well, my wife has MS. My wife's sisters have MS. She has aunts with MS. It's a very big deal in my family as well. That's a much stronger connection. If mm. I could have led with that in my introduction saying, hey, Dave, I'm reading your book. I'm loving it. By the way, you talked about supporting MS society, and that's something that I've gone through in my family as well. And I'm curious, have you read this book on overcoming multiple sclerosis. My wife really loves this book, and if you haven't heard about it, maybe you'd love reading it too. Oh, and by the way, I'm putting on the tent and da-da-da-da. Now, I could do that in just a manipulative way. I'm just doing this to try to get what I want out of Dave. Or I can do this in a sincere way because I care about Dave, and hey, I really care about MS, and I think he really would be interested in it. But also, it's just a great way to break the ice and make conversation comfortable and so you can use these tools of influence to do bad things. You can use these tools of influence to do good things. I think Dave wants to speak at my event. If I can talk to him about my event and he finds out about it, it's something that he wants to do. So I'm going to use these tools to try to give myself a chance to share this good thing with Dave that I think he wants to hear about. And using those tools of influence like common interests can help break through barriers and get access to people that you might not otherwise be able to get through to if you just sent them some sort of standard template pitch. For sure. That's, that is great advice, isn't it? And it, it just goes to show as well that you can't, in a way, you can't really outsource this stuff, is it? You, you've got to go and do the research yourself and read about these people and find out what that connection is with you, right? You have to do it personally. And that's why, you, in a way, you can't really scale it. It has to be a quality thing. It has to be a targeted thing, right? If you want to do it properly. 
Yeah, it's tough. I mean, I have virtual assistants and I wish I could outsource all of this to them. And I do outsource parts of it. Like I'll go send them out and I'll say, hey, I want you to go through this article of 50 top social media influencers and I want you to put all their names in a spreadsheet and get all their social media profiles and try to find their email addresses. I'll outsource that part. But yeah, when it actually comes to composing that email, writing the email, customizing the email, I do that myself. I do that outreach myself because yeah, I just I could outsource it, but the results wouldn't be very good. No, exactly. Is it well it's not it's not real then, is it? I mean that's what people will detect whether or not it's real and heartfelt, as you said, whether you yeah. care about that person, right? Yeah, I mean we all get emails every day that we get and we can look at it and in five well, I should say half of a second you can tell yeah. if an email was written just to you or if it was sent to 5,000 other people. We can all detect. We've all got amazing spam filters in our brains. We can detect this stuff. And so, and especially these, these influencers who get a lot of requests for all sorts of stuff, they've trained their brains to spot people who are exactly. not customizing the pitch, especially for them. And so I know that I have to put certain key things in there to tell them, hey, I am reaching out to you and only you, and I'm not blasting this email out to a bunch of other people at the same time. Oh, yeah, no shortcuts. Hey, Josh, before we round up and give the listeners links so they can go and find out a bit more about you, Shenzhen sounds like a great place. Michael, we need to get ourselves out there, I think, as a part of our tour, whether it's this round of the tour of Asia. But what do you think about getting out to Shenzhen at some point and going and seeing the startup scene there? We can go and have a coffee with Josh if he's not too busy. I think it's I think it's actually really important for us to go there, and I think yeah. this is one of the great things about talking to people that live in those in those yeah. um, locations. And that is, you learn so much, but you'll learn a lot more by actually being there for a while and just trying to figure out who the influencers are, who the stakeholders are, and actually what the vibe is like there. We don't know, and it's hard to it's hard to tell. But it's great to talk to somebody who has lived there for a year and can actually compare it to another place that he's lived in the region. We can better understand the differences. We've got to get there, though. We got to get up there. Exactly. Yep. You got to come. Exactly. It's on our list. Yeah. The first cup of coffee is on me. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, Josh. There's so much going on in your world. Projects, side projects. Where do we find out more about you? My personal website has links to everywhere else, and that is joshsteimley.com. Steimley spelled S-T-E-I-M as in Mary, L-E. That's where it is. That's the jumping off point. Go and check it out. Go and check out his press page as well because, as I said before, if you want evidence of what the benefit is getting out there and making yourself accessible, it's there. Go and check that out as well as some of the things that he's written, some very interesting articles as well prolific content producer that's josh steinley everybody thank you so much for joining us today author entrepreneur world traveler and let's keep uh, let's keep you in the loop for the show It'd be great to have you back on at some point in the future because you've obviously got a lot of things going on in the future and things may change events which you may want to report back on as well as you know some of the latest developments things change so fast in your part of the world as well so you know, keep us updated and you know what's new what's exciting thanks so much for joining us today josh thank you graham michael thank you so much for having me on the show it's been a pleasure to be with you you were awesome thank you so much you've been listening to asia tech podcast find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com